What's up everybody? So today we're back here with another episode of the After Virtue series. Today we're going to be talking about chapter 3, starting that out. And um, hopefully we can get through this chapter in about 5-ish, 4 or 5-ish episodes. So again, notes are going to be linked in the video description below. With all that in mind, let's get right into it. So chapter 3 here, we're going to be looking at emotivism's social content context. That's the title of the chapter. And for the first few pages, we're going to be going over some stuff related to sociology. And that's going to be our guiding principle in our investigation of emotivism, our continuing investigation here. And then we're going to go over some different social contexts. Then we'll talk about Max Weber. And then we'll talk about some things which McIntyre calls characters that are pretty important to the story. So with that in mind, let's get right into it. Let's jump into this first paragraph because it's quite important for the context of the chapter. So right off the bat, McIntyre says that a moral philosophy, with emotivism being no exception, presupposes a sociology. What does that mean? He's going to go on to explain that every moral philosophy implicitly or explicitly assumes a conceptual analysis of the relationship of an agent to his or her reasons, motives, intentions, and actions. And in doing this, presupposes some claim that these concepts are embodied or at least can be in the real social world. So the idea here is that all moral philosophies presuppose that their moral philosophies actually can be embodied in agents. If you have a moral philosophy that can't be lived out, well then it's not really a moral philosophy. Because moral philosophy has a practical component to it. It determines how we live. It tells us what we should do, etc. So there has to be a sociological component to every moral philosophy. Now, this is quite interesting and it's worth dwelling on. What are the social components of utilitarianism you can think through? What are the social components of a virtue ethics? Here we're going to talk about Kant a little bit. So. He goes on to say that even Kant, who sometimes seems to restrict moral agency and so on, implies otherwise in his other writings. So, so even Kant has a practical sociological dimension to his work here. Now, McIntyre says, and this is the crucial point in this paragraph, I think, it would be a decisive refutation of a moral philosophy to show that moral agency on its own account of the matter could never be lived out socially embodied and it also follows that we have not understood the claims of any moral philosophy until we have spelled out what its social embodiment would be so this is a condition for refutation of moral theories here and what McIntyre is saying is that you need to be able to one understand how a moral philosophy embodies sociological content in order to fully understand that that moral philosophy you need to understand how it is lived out what are the social ramifications of it and two we can decisively refute meaning we can completely refute a moral philosophy if we can show that it cannot be lived out okay so he's going to go on to say that some moral philosophers have done this but emotivists have not. Emotivists have not laid out these sociological conditions for their theory. We therefore must perform it for them. That's the end of the paragraph. So, so this paragraph is really setting the stage for the rest of the chapter. That's why I quoted from it so much and dwelt on it. What we're doing is we're talking about how moral philosophies need a sociology. They need to be lived out, embodied through humans in some way. And if they can't do that, well, then that's a refutation of that theory. I think it's worth dwelling on that for a bit. Maybe pause the video, think about that. I think that McIntyre is correct in saying that. And also, we have to do this for emotivism, since emotivists' proponents have not done so. So let's, so let's take a look at this, and that's going to be that next paragraph here, onto the following page. So McIntyre points out that the key to the social content, the sociological content of emotivism, is the fact that emotivism obliterates any genuine distinction between manipulative, manipulative and non-manipulative social relations. What does that mean? That means if you live out, as I said in referencing the previous paragraph, if you live out emotivism, if you embody it in the world, you will obliterate the distinction 
between manipulative and non-manipulative social relations. Okay, what does that mean? Let's, let's go into that a little bit more. Remember, we're tracing out the sociological implications of an emotivist theory here, an emotivist ethics here. What exactly would that mean for us to live out emotivism? So McIntyre is going to bring in Kant, for example, here. And he's going to say, consider the contrast between, for example, Kantian ethics and emotivism. So for Kant, and a parallel point can be made about many earlier moral philosophers, the difference between a human relationship uninformed by morality and one so informed is precisely the difference between one in which each person treats the other primarily as a means to his or her ends and one in which each other and one in which each treats the other as an end okay so basically what he's he's saying here is he, he's making a reference to Kant's means ends distinction here and he's saying that in a there, there's a difference in Kantian ethics you can treat people as a means and you can treat people as an end this is one of Kant's famous maxims so he has three it's the second formulation of it and McIntyre goes on to say to treat someone else as an end is to offer them what I take to be good reasons for acting in one way rather than another but to leave it to them to evaluate those reasons. So here McIntyre is saying that treating somebody as an ends is respecting their rationality as a free human agent. Treating somebody as an ends means offering them up good reasons for doing something and allowing them to rationally weigh those reasons. It is not to manipulate someone into doing something based upon psychological persuasion or such rhetoric. So think there about maybe the sophists in the platonic dialogues or people, public speakers, maybe politicians who are offering up psychological manipulative tricks to try and convince people of positions. Kant and McIntyre here are saying, look, that is treating somebody as a means to an end, maybe an agenda perhaps, you're trying to get that person to buy into your agenda. If you wanna treat somebody as a rational free agent, treating them as an end in themselves, you need to offer them up reasons, rationality, and let them, based on their own freedom, autonomy, rationality, decide on an issue. And this, again, this is a Kantian example of how if we lived out an emotivist ethic and we attempted to kind of assume this Kantian framework along with it, emotivism, and by Kantian framework, I mean the means ends distinction in persons, if we lived on an emotivist ethic and assumed this Kantian assumption, then we would obliterate the distinction between manipulative and non-manipulative language. Let me get to that last point there. So, now here, going to the next page, McIntyre is going to spell that out a little bit. And he's going to say, look, again, if we live out this emotivist theory, then what we're doing is we're dis we are not able, under emotivism, to offer up rational argumentation for ethical positions. Remember, we talked about this in the previous videos. Under emotivism, you can't offer justification. You can't offer rational justification for ethical judgments. So we talked about abortion. We talked about euthanasia. We talked about, I touched on the environmental issues. Under emotivism, everything reduces to psychological persuasion. Everything reduces to an attempt to manipulate the emotions of somebody to get them to side with you. There is no rationality in ethics because again everything at its root is going to be an appeal to your emotions, an appeal to the subjective emotional states and again touched on that in the previous videos. So the point here is that under emotivism we cannot treat people as ends, insofar as we've defined ends, as I just did on the previous page there. We can't treat people as ends because we cannot give them rational reasons to prefer one ethical view to another. We can only treat people in a manipulative way by offering up psychological persuasion. We can only try to persuade them through rhetoric, psychological tricks, appealing to their emotions, trying to manipulate their emotions to get them to side one way or another. That's going to be McIntyre's point with this example here. McIntyre's, the, the, the main idea, for those who may not be getting it, is that under emotivism, we can't treat people 
as ends, we can only treat people as means. And that's because we cannot respect their rationality. And so this is going to be just a small point or a small part of the sociological content of emotivism. It's going to be a small part of living emotivism out. And we can come up with further examples. I want you to come up with your own examples of other sociological implications of emotivism. What exactly would it mean to live out and embody an emotivist ethics? Off the top of my head, I can simply say that it would seem to be very challenging to do so. Just because we speak as if ethics is objective. We speak and we live out, we embody a, an idea that ethics really is a standard between right and wrong. And we speak that way. We talk about objective right and wrongs. We, we don't, we, we think it seems that we can offer up rational justification for ethical positions. Whereas emotivism, if you were to live it out, would deny that. So it, so it seems to me that another sociological a piece of sociological content for the emotivist would be to be trapped in a lived contradiction. It's very difficult to live out emotivism. And again, I touched on this in some of the very beginning it videos a little bit. So let's look at that. Let's, let's continue on here, page 24 again. I'm now at the second paragraph. So McIntyre's just gonna talk about what I just said. He's gonna say others are always means, never ends under emotivism. Now he's gonna go on to say, He's going to talk about this crucial question. This is going to uh, provide a shift in the direction of this chapter. So right now we've, we've, we've established that under emotivism, there's, there's a lot of sociological implications to it. One of those implications is treating people as means and never as ends in the Kantian sense. Again, I challenge you to think up your own examples of what emotivism would entail in a sociological context. So McIntyre here is gonna go on to talk about some dense stuff. So let's, let's get right into that. So he's gonna say, what then would the social world look like if seen with emotivist eyes? And what would the social world be like if the truth of emotivism came to be widely presupposed? That's gonna be our guiding question right now. What exactly would the social world look like, emphasis on the word look, if seen through an emotivist ethics? And what would it be like if we all presupposed emotivism? The general form of the answer to these questions is now clear, but the social detail depends in part on the nature of particular social contexts. So what right here he's saying that, look, we've already talked about the general answer to both of these questions in that means ends distinction. But what that exactly is going to entail is going to depend on particular individuals and social contexts. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna take this idea between an obliteration of the means ends distinction and apply it to different social contexts. And so here we're gonna look at what McIntyre is gonna develop into the character of the aesthete, the aesthetic man, the aesthetic person, the aesthetic woman. And he's gonna reference some stuff like the portrait of a lady by Henry or by um, William, or, or yes, yes, William Gass and Henry James. So, so this, this is quite interesting because what McIntyre is doing here, and I won't go into that much detail because I want to keep it a little bit more brief than 20 or 30 minutes, but what McIntyre is doing here is he's referencing this work and he's saying, look, here's an example of a social context in which the means and the ends distinction has been obliterated. This context is a higher class, wealthier, group and again it's it's coming from a book but again we're gonna we're gonna generalize this later in the chapter to reality and so this is providing sort of an introduction to the idea of the aesthete the basic point he's making here is that is found here on page 25 and so I'll I'll read it out here. He says, it will in fact turn out that the portrait of a lady has a key place within a long tradition of moral commentary. Earlier members include Diderot's La Neuville de Romeu, Remu and Kierkegaard's Anton Eller. The unifying preoccupation with that tradition is the condition of those who see in the social world nothing but a meeting place for individual wills, each with its own set of attitudes and preferences 
and who understand that world solely as an arena for the achievement of their own satisfaction, who interpret reality as a series of opportunities for their enjoyment and for whom the last enemy is boredom. So this moral sphere for these people embodied in these three texts, again, these are just texts, but we're gonna generalize from these texts later in this chapter to reality. The general idea is that the moral sphere for these characters is nothing but pure emotion. And you have this obliteration between treating people as means and treating them as ends. In the portrait of a lady, McIntyre says that, back on page 24, that a common theme throughout the book is the commodification of humans. So not in the sense of buy, literally buying and selling humans, but treating them as if they were nothing but commodities. And the again, you can go and look at these texts on your own, but the you want to think about how in these texts, and perhaps you can you can think of a novel that you've read, in these texts, in a novel that you've read, how living out an emotivist theory, which it seems that these characters in these texts do, would lead to destroying the distinction between manipulative and non-manipulative language. I think that it's difficult to wrap your head around this if you haven't actually read these texts. Perhaps you can think about your own experience, but again, I think the, the point is just to understand what McIntyre, McIntyre's main idea here is. We're gonna develop this at a greater depth later in the chapter, and in chapters four and five. But here, let's look at an example he gives on page 25. So the younger Ramu, Kierkegaard's A, and Ralph Touche, put this aesthetic attitude, so these are the characters in those texts, put this aesthetic attitude to work in very different environments, but the attitude is recognizably the same, and even the environments have something in common. So again, here we're touching on the idea that this emotivist sociology, this, this obliteration between manipulative and non-manipulative language is going to take on different forms. It's going to mean different things. It's going, it's going to express different outcomes in diff, within different contexts. And McIntyre's pointing out three contexts, Remu, Kierkegaard's character, and Ralph Touche, and, and he's pointing out these three characters and saying, look, all these three people are embodying this emotivist sociology, but they're, 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 you have different outcomes in each case. Different social contexts relate to different outcomes. So he's going to go on to say then that they, they are environments in which the problem of enjoyment arises in the context of leisure, in which large sums of money have created some social distance from the necessity of work. So maybe think today about today's upper middle class, the people that simply don't work. They have a lot of investments maybe. They are always trying to look for the next newest and greatest thing. I mean, Elon Musk seems to be a very good example. I don't know him, but, but he, he would seem to fit this bill. They're always trying to look for enjoyment. They're always trying to stave off boredom. Now, that, that I think is, is, is something that you need to dwell on a little bit and, and simply kind of think about somebody like that and, and what they would really entail if they were to live out this, this emotivist ethics. So he's gonna go on, McIntyre's gonna go on to say here that, let's see here. This is not to say that the realm of what Kierkegaard calls the aesthetic is restricted to the rich, nor is to say that the rich are all these characters, but it is, and this is the key, it is to suggest that if we are to understand fully the con social context of that obliteration of the distinction between manipulative and non-manipulative social relations, which motivates details, we ought to consider some other social contexts. So McIntyre, I think, is laying the groundwork here for what he's gonna develop later in the chapter and later in the book, what he's gonna develop into characters. And so he's pointing out that first we have to look at this aesthetic life, this way of staving off boredom. And we're gonna develop that later in the book. So just note that and, and be a little patient with how we're gonna do this. Now he's gonna make a shift in the text to talking about the bureaucratic manager, and that's gonna be the next character we look at. So he's gonna do the same exact thing. He's gonna talk here about bureaucratic rationality is the rationality of matching means to ends economically and efficiently. And he's gonna go on on page 26 to talk about Max Weber. So let me briefly touch on this managerial thing, and then we'll stop the video 
and resume next time. So in this bottom paragraph on page 25, again, I told you he's developing, the, he's starting to lay the groundwork for the development of this character of modernity called the manager. And he's saying here that there's a contrast between the asti and the manager. The rich asti with a plethora of means searches restlessly for an ends on which he may employ them, again, to stave off boredom, to seek adventure. And he's doing that in, in the context of this emotivist game. But the organization is characterly, characteristically engaged in a competitive struggle for scarce resources to put to the service of those ends. It is therefore the central responsibility of managers to direct and redirect their organization's available resources, both human and non-human, as effectively as possible. Every bureaucratic organization embodies some explicit or implicit definition of costs and benefits from which the criteria of effectiveness are derived. Okay, so let's think about that for a minute. We have, again, the asteat, or the groundwork for this character, and we have the groundwork for the managerial character. And both of these characters are archetypes of modernity, you could say. They are, in some sense, living out, and again, I'm not, I'm generalizing here. McIntyre is generalizing. We're not talking about all athletes, rich people. We're not talking about all upper class people. We're not talking about all managers. We're saying that the archetypal athlete, A-S-T-H-E-T-E, and the archetypal manager are embodying, in some sense, this obliteration of the distinction between means and ends. McIntyre uses those novels to partially support his claim to that for the athlete, and McIntyre is going to develop a robust conception of the social sciences later in the text to, to enhance his argument that managers embody this, this, excuse me, embody this means ends obliteration. So that's what's going on in these first couple pages here. It's really a ground setting for the remainder of the text. The main point here is that you want to understand that emotivism entails a sociology, and that sociology is an obliteration between manipulative and non-manipulative language, moral language. So when you, under emotivism, you can't provide rational justification, as we've discussed before, but you can't provide rational justification for ethical judgments, moral judgments. And when you do that, when you, when, you, when you fail to provide adequate reason, you end up only able to talk to people, convince people of moral judgments due to, or you, you end up only being able to convince people of moral judgments based on psychological persuasion and rhetoric. And that is manipulative in itself. So that's going to be Magnar's first point, and then he's going to go on to say, look, in so different social contexts, this obliteration of manipulative and non-manipulative language is going to produce different outcomes. Here's one context, the upper middle class, or upper class, high culture, asthete, who doesn't work, who has this necessary distance between work and life, as he puts it. And then you have also the manager, and then we're going to go on to develop a character or an idea of the psychologist or the therapist. And then in the beginning of the book, which we didn't read the, the prologue, he talks about, I think, the conservative moralist or, or something, something like that. But we'll discuss the prologue near the end of this series. And McIntyre's point is just that he's, he's setting the groundwork for the development of these characters and the development of this idea that emotivism sociological content is going to provide us with different glimpses into modernity. And so if you can just take away one thing from this video, it, it, it's really to reflect on that idea that emotivism entails the distinction, this, this obliteration between manipulative and non-manipulative language. So reflect on that, think about how, if emotivism were true, how would it be embodied in the world? If you believed it, how would you live it out? What would that mean? I know for me, and, and I'll end the video here, if I were to live out emotivism, I wouldn't be able to rationally convince anyone of moral judgments and moral positions like abortion, euthanasia, the environment, gun control, whatever you want to say. Everything would eventually, you couldn't provide rational reasons for those positions 
under emotivism, and so you would have to end up providing rhetoric and psychological manipulations to manipulate people's emotions in order to have them accept or deny the ethical or moral positions. So with that in mind, we're going to pick up with Max Weber next video, and that's going to be important. We're going to develop this idea of the manager, pick up with Weber's work. So again, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I hope that was sufficiently clear. I know it's a really dense text. It's pretty tough to go through because the arguments are often nuanced and oftentimes they're not in traditional argumentative form. But with that in mind, please like, comment, subscribe, share your thoughts below, and I will see you next time.